Okay, if there was another movie that I would actually appreciate called The Burning, mm -hmm. this would be it. This film is <laughs> as burning. Yeah, it's burning. But it should be really. The, but it's, it's only the, slightly more burning. But it's more okay. <laughs> but it's uh, it's dancing around the subject of burning. Right. All right yeah. So coming yeah. up next, we're going to talk our top ten burning films rate, ranked on the amount of burning <laughs> right. taking yeah. place in them in our Patreon selection pick mm -hmm. for October: The Skin I Live In. Come join us. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from Go Film Reviews. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thanks for watching. Thanks for finding us, and, and thank you for all subscribers and viewers. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the skin I live in. Uh, you can also reach out the show on Twitter and Instagram, and check out the Patreon for great options. What in the world is going on with this movie? Yeah, and again, this is from our one of our patrons, Brian Eger. Thank you, Brian, for always picking films that, uh, while I may not, I, I've always enjoyed them, but it's ones I really haven't had the notion to go see yet. We're getting kind of what the flavor <laughs> of aesthetic Brian likes yep. with these picks. I, yep. I, I, I kind of get in his little bit of flavor. Yeah, probably. so we're back with the skin I live in. Yep. Uh, Robert Ledgard is a brilliant surgeon attempting to work through the traumas of the past. His newest creation is a synthetic skin capable of withstanding excessive damage. His test subject is a mysterious woman who is held captive at his home. Fear. A woman who looks very similar to his late wife. A woman who holds the secret to Robert's terrible past. Okay, this is the second film uh, I've ever seen of Pedro's. I've seen Talk to Her that was, uh, I think, got nominated for Best Foreign Film uh, in 2002. I, was, I wasn't paying attention to right. Best Foreign Film when I was 12. Though, but so if, you, if you know his, he has a distinct style as well. It's a lot of bold colors. It's a lot of really lush environments, really, you know, tantalizing, salacious topics. Um, and really kind of all about obsessions a little bit. And this is definitely fits all their ingredients. It's yeah. almost like a Brian De Palma film. That's not, you're not wrong. I would, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> There's well, a reason why they call him the that. Spanish Brian De Palma. Because yeah. I also have only seen one other Almodovar film, and that is his most recent film, uh, Pain and Glory, with Antonio Banderas, who actually, uh, this was a reuniting of him and Almodovar for this film. They previously worked together 21 years prior and came back for The Skin I Live In. And I saw a lot of identity, trauma, sexual identity, definitely, in that film. And I see that on play here, but yeah. it's interesting because... I haven't seen any other Almodovar films than these two, but I would say that they're markedly completely different in their story, but not completely different in their themes. No, in the likes and the aesthetics mm -hmm. and everything. I don't I suck at that word today. Um, so if you don't know, it's a lot of twists. He also has a lot of twists in his story. So almost when you watch his films, you're like, hey, what am I seeing? What am I really... Because it's, you know, the beginning of the movie, it's screen ver on screens, right? He does that... Uh, Film the screen, and then you're watching the screen. Not mm -hmm. only that, it's almost like you're observed, observation, you're a test subject, even the people that are corrupted. Another thing is, there's really no protagonist in this movie. I don't think anybody is really kind of a heroine in this movie. Yeah, I mean, if we go back to one of the classical definitions of protagonist, it's whoever sets the story in motion. And I guess in that way, I would and say Richard, that, right. like, that you know, Robert's done that with, with Antonio Banderas' character because he has a choice at the beginning of this film in where how he is how far he's going to take his obsession, his anger, his trauma, right? And he continually ratchets things up. So I guess there would be that. But going back to I think what you mean is like the the difference between like do we like our characters and are they interesting to us? None of these characters are really likable. No. Um, they started some of them started likable and have slowly evolved into monsters. But they're unlikable yet interesting, which is you have to have one of the two at least to make a good character. And I think interesting is definitely something you can give to almost every character in the movie. Interesting as well as the setup and the environment. I'd say a lot of art direction does fit very well. Costuming fits very well mm -hmm. in this movie. And that helps the characters play their role. She wears a synthetic fabric uh, gown. Yeah. Um, and then the beginning of the movie, you see her doing yoga poses, which is like, okay, is she doing right this for recreation? But you know, this is more than just for recreation. It's almost a necessity to do. And then you get to a little more, you can do a little more avant-garde scenery, mm -hmm. but it fits to the story. So it's a little more like play of film filmmaking as well. Yeah, there's there's a sense that, well, first of all, she does she looks better doing yoga than I'll ever look doing yoga. Um, right. But they have the skin itself as it kind of like is on her. I thought maybe it was like a fashion thing. I, I Again, I knew very little about going into this movie. I think the less you know, it's better. 
I think so yeah. too. It's kind of like you know other films we've talked about in that in that nature too, where it's like I prefer to go in blind, and I tend yeah. to enjoy myself more when I go in blind. The only problem is if you don't see a trailer or something like this for the movie, this is one of those movies that would skirt right past you. So it's kind of that that little uh, you know kind of mixture of like I got to see a little bit to know I'm going to watch it, but not too much so I know that I'm going to be able to experience it. Uh, and I think Elena Anaya is fantastic in the role because she has yeah. to play someone who is very like almost Alice in Wonderland like you know she's like very innocent she's exploring and it's stuck in this world with all these strange characters and the way that we're trying to uncover her past yes. as she tries to uncover it yeah so even when you get the big reveal she still has to play this uh, I'm a seducer not only that I'm a victim now that I'm a perpetrator mm -hmm. now that I don't know really my orientation anymore or yeah. I'm trying to find it. So there's definitely multiple layers for that performance. There are multiple layers for Antonio Banderas' character. He is, is, he's a victim himself, but he's not really healing himself. He's just trying to put a Band-Aid over it, mm -hmm. literally covering up a new identity. Right. And I think that speaks to uh, Almodovar and Banderas' abilities to work together. Is Because I was re actually reading a, from an interview where he mentioned that he pulled Banderas aside after a couple days of filming and said, you're playing this character too maniacally. I need you to be more restrained. Like this is what I want to see: is that you're not, you're not this like quote unquote Doctor Frankenstein where you've gone insane over what you're creating, but it's more of you're kind of like blurring the lines between what you're doing out of yeah. vengeance or what you're doing out of like the ability to create. And your emotions are getting broken. And I think most other actors who hear that from a director might think, "Don't tell me how to do my job. I'm gonna tell you how to do yours." <laughs> I've worked with some actors that are abilities to. To collaborate, and I've worked with some who really hate that introspection, right. and it, it's nice to see I have to work with that. So I think his explanation explains a lot when I do the research why uh, Pedro really liked this movie because it's, it's more about Richard's slow, tedious, methodical to heal himself. Yeah, which is not what we say correct. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's not really. But it's his patience mm -hmm. and his methods of all right, you know duration of doing this and what would we would interpret as almost torture yeah. he's torturing himself almost well, too. and there's that this movie bothered me in a sense because i i think, I think it to. should bother you yeah <laughs> it I should think bother it's me in many the senses popcorn feel good movie, um, which i really i kind of enjoy sometimes yeah, yeah i like that that testing of a film that inherently i probably won't ever watch again but i I really like took into the fact of like unraveling this mystery. This is a movie that could never be made in the U.S. And I say that because the U.S. audiences would not, at least patience. at this point, wouldn't have the patience to uncover the layers, and they probably wouldn't like some of what we consider to be more risque material taking place here. This is a this is a messed up narrative, and not for what it presents us in terms of sexual identity, but for what it pre shows us in revenge. Yes, um, this is a harsher revenge film than most other American revenge films that think you just gotta shoot the bad guys. <laughs> and it's a little more camp, yeah. right? This doesn't yeah. go camp. And also, this could be a heavily cliched, ridiculous movie. You have mad scientists, mm -hmm. you have uh, the person encapsulated in torture, you have <coughs> the, you know, deadly, a simple revenge story. It could have gone very bad. We've seen these stories many times We've before, many the mad science and everything. So there's a lot of <laughs> cliches, but like we said, how you use your cliches makes it more interesting. This yeah. is like a lot of cliches, but well, it's it's methodically done and well crafted. Under the deft hand of Alma Dovar, and again, I say that only having seen two of the films, but I, I'm aware of his presence in the, in the industry. Um, under his very, very, very well put hands, does he make a movie that, again, like, like kind of like we said, wouldn't work under most other directors because he has a singular vision and... This is a movie that if you described the plot to me, I'd be like, well, that's really weird. I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah. And that's, and I would assume it was a B-horror movie. I would assume it was a camp movie. I would assume it's like heavily into those areas. But he presents it in a very straight-laced right. idea. He believes this is happening, so we believe it's happening. Yes, and it's, uh, it's one of the hesitants for me to watch it because I was like, plastic surgery, it's all about beauty and aesthetics and just, you know... Uh, how ugly you can be underneath, and that's that's the perception I have. I expected really, the, the yeah. Spanish language version of Nip Tuck. Right, so <laughs> that's like Chuck, what I got. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking because mm -hmm. it's plastic surgery, and and then I really enjoyed the book of uh, Chuck Palahniuk, which you can't make it to a movie yet. I think it's Beautiful Creatures, mm. and that's all about you know supermodels and you know they got disfigured and plastic surgery and all that stuff. So I kind of assigned that to almost this may be what the movie is yeah, going to be. But I was thinking not, neon demon levels, <laughs> demon, but that's not. There's a little more. 
of yeah, it, it's the vessel. Plastic surgery is the vessel to explain their character. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I was watching the film, kind of watching the film with my wife. She was not really interested when I described what little I knew about it. Um, so she fell asleep on the couch, and I was like, you know, I got some time before I go to bed. I'll start the movie. And I got about 10 minutes in, she woke up, she saw Antonio Banderas, and like all of us, she continued watching. Um, and what I really appreciated was that this movie won her over across that the, the rest of the film, where she kind of woke up and she was like, what are you watching? And I, you know, I said, the movie, and she like kept like sitting further up and further up as it went, and kind of like, if, yeah. if this movie had been an hour longer, she probably would have had her face against the TV screen at the end. That's how close she got to what was going on. And she made a, a good point, something that I maybe wouldn't have been able to say, is that she made the point that the science in the film is actually not terribly insane in terms of like the synthetic skin and like yeah. his process for doing it because she, you know she went to school for all this stuff. So she actually said the scientific methods and the the work that he puts into it is kind of we made the comparison to Jurassic Park, which is it's theoretical, but it is possible. In Jurassic Park, of course, if you had a million uh, mosquitoes, you could create a dinosaur, but you need to find a million amber mosquitoes. So it's like theoretically possible with the synthetic skin and just the way that he goes through all the different processes involved with the surgery. Yes. It's not something that you can, that like is completely out of left field. So That's right. It's grounded a little bit. Yes. It could be possible. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so Pedro works a lot. Bold. Very bold. Mm -hmm. Lots of colors. Colors are important. Uh, my God, red is very important in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, purple used almost like a precious like his daughter, mm -hmm. uh, when she's wearing purple, so it's very precious. And of course, when you violate a precious being, what you're going to get villainated, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in a lot of very color twists and everything, so it's almost like braid entanglement. But Pedro is very patient with his filmmaking. Like you said, the audience, American audiences probably don't have the patience for it because he holds scenes like, "All right, we're doing multiple takes of her doing yoga. What the hell is going on?" <laughs> And she's almost in cat is almost like a prisoner, almost like you know, sleeping beauty or Rapunzel stuff in the tower. Mm -hmm. And then you see like all oh, there's really not a lot of contact, so really shot very interesting without explaining very much. Because you're constantly going, What the hell is going on? Yeah, yeah. it's 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 an onion. It's got layers. And then you got Caddy you know, Tiger yeah. Man coming in. And yeah. then you're like, What now we're really going off, but it's an ex explanation of why he has to. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it's funny because I thought that I thought his presence in the film was going to have more of an impact in the overall film, and it, it's it's more of a character defining impact than it is an actual right. plot defining one. I thought like, oh, here's where our movie's headed. That's not where it is. Um, but what happens there kind of defines how we're going to peel back the layers of this onion. And I think that um, it, it's a maybe that's my biggest flaw with the movie is I feel like there's this voyeuristic intention of there's a lot of sexual assault in the film and i didn't like looking at it in the way that i like you know like i wasn't like interested in seeing it play out as much as it no did. even though i have a large appetite for a lot of disturbing movies oh i like being disturbed yeah like yeah it's, it's something it horrific but even when you games. see those and you don't see anything very much but you see that in the sounds and the actions and everything you're kind of like squinting like uh, well it reminded me of funny yeah. games where it's kind of like it made me feel bad for watching it um, you know, like it, it kind of tells you like, this is what you want. This is what you want in that movie. And that's kind of how I felt like we were being kind of given this voyeuristic view of some things that was really like, but you got a I reaction thought, when I thought it was done though, it kept going. And again, yeah. that was again, the length of the shots, the length of the sequences is a very, uh, un English thing, I guess, when we, when we talk about the film is that it, you know, the quick cuts would be what we have in America. Yeah. This is like, we're just going to show you, and you're going to have to Set the camera this. down, put it on stilts, yeah. and hold it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. which is a lot of, Pedro does a lot of holding the scenes, a lot of, I think, putting the camera on legs, just setting it down. Um, well, they only use shaky cam once, and that was when the, the gun in the bedroom. Yeah. Boom, boom, they use shaky cam. Really, with that, it pretty much just sets the camera down, unless the scene... You know, almost like talented Mr. Ripley, you know, the patron of request. Exactly. So yeah. a lot of a lot of little the action in rather than move the camera. Very little, little it does move, but very little noticing camera movement. Mm. Um, so it's a lot of just holding the scene. That makes it even more tur you know, because we wanna like, all right, go away, go away. <laughs> a yeah, lot there's, of stuff. there's a list of directors that have that the, the, the joke that I make, which is that they've never learned the meaning of the word cut. And I'm going to add Almodovar to that list. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a fuzzish way, but like sometimes they just like, you're, you're lingering it. to the point where you're like, Hold why? It. Why are we doing this? And you kind of get like frustrated and mad about it. 
then you get a re the reaction yeah. that they want. Yeah, that's the reaction. Yeah, mm -hmm. the artists want a reaction, and he's going to get it, and he's going to hold it, and that's it's something like, okay, get over it. No, I don't want to. Yeah. Right. Can we please move on? And, but it goes smooth. I like the editing. It, it is very silky smooth. Edited. I liked the ending. I didn't like. I guess I didn't like the unclimacticness of parts of the ending. Um, right. I kind of knew where it was going the last 10, 15 minutes. I kind of wanted and they to... Gave me what I, they gave me what I expected, but not what I wanted. And what, I, what I usually want is I want you to give me, some, give me some more layers to our finale, and I feel like the finale is very cut and dry when, when you know, like... You've been lushful the entire time. Yeah, first, first without back. spoiling the ending, there is a sex scene, and when that sex scene begins, I'm like, okay, I know how this is going to go. And it went exactly that way from, from moment one to the end of the film. I but the exactly ending went very happened. dry at the end. Yes. It You're reminded me, though, of like of, of the most recent film I saw in a theater, Dune, which was the ending of that film. Because that was a half book, it ends in a very much like, oh, okay, like I really, you know, I'd like to know what happens next. At least with Dune, I know there's another half coming. Whereas this film ends and I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I accept it, but it wasn't wowing me in the way that the rest of the film wowed me. No, not like the movie Fury, where they yeah. had that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a very dry ending for a lot of stuff that's very lushful, very enticing, very full, and very aesthetic. Um, and then you get the ending, which is kind of just kind of almost like a balloon going out, just mm, yeah. crash. Yeah. Um, also, projecting of women almost like unwrapped gifts. You mm -hmm. can see it in the paintings. You see it in the environments. You see um, Vera when she's on the couch, almost like in, with the red and everything, almost like she's an unread present, just relaxed and waiting for Richard to come in. So I like the presentation of that as well because they almost the paintings all around him is too is showing what he how he treats Vera. Well, and, the and there's a level of voyeurism because most of the males in the film are going to do horrible things to some of the women in the film, yeah. and. I, I yes. don't know if there's a scene in the film where a woman takes off her clothes, but there's a lot of scenes where men take off women's clothes. And yeah. I think that, that again, like, not That's only important. does it give you that uncomfortability, but it also plays with this, this idea of identity, of who's in charge in this kind of a relationship, and who, you know, and kind of like playing with, like, the, the gender roles that are at play here, and especially for a film that deals with gender and gender roles in the way that this one does, I, I connected with that in a very uncomfortable way. Um, this actually is based on a book called Tarantula. It's in French, came out in 1984. There's a lot of similarities of the adaptation. There's a lot of differences to um, if you want. I have never read the book, so I just no. recently got into English adaptation, so maybe I should read it. But so the recent that when it was published, it was published as My Gal, uh, M Y G A L E. I'm probably mispronouncing it, and then it republished in English as Tarantula. And it did take Almodovar ten years to write the script. And he, he said, as each iteration of the script came along, it got further and further away from the book. Um, and to the point where I'm, I'm happy it's not called Tarantula. I'm happy it's not called by its original name because if you're going to adapt something... It's called something, The Burning. Yeah. <laughs> if you're going to adapt something to the point, though, where it ceases to be a, a actual adaptation and more of an inspired by, I'd rather have you pull it all the way out with the title as well. Um, the events in the story actually happen in real life. If you have, I know Roman history. It took to uh, a year of studying um, ancient Roman history, and if you read about Nero and Sporus, you understand the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually did happen in real life. Um, Nero lost his wife and took on another person that looked exactly like his wife. Um, so if you want to know uh, how it actually happened in real life, and that was kind of the, probably the spawn inspiration for the whole entire story. Mm. So yeah. Um, I'm not gonna read the entire and you know whole thing, but it's it's been around for a decade, so <laughs> that that's been spoiled. Okay? Right? Yeah, we're not gonna spoil the movie, but right. you know. Yeah. So <laughs> if you know that story, yeah, you kind of get what the whole story is about. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, overall, it's a it's what I like. It's disturbing. It's psychological. It's a horror movie with not a lot of screams, gore, and jump scares, and all the stuff that make you fly your popcorn and all that fun stuff. It is an authentic horror movie where the characters aren't it's not it's not a lovely scene. It's not any where well, I don't think anybody has it has everybody has a bastardation disturbing aspect what love is. It's almost like just coveting. Yeah, it feels like Almodovar's nightmare. You know, it feels like like he's putting you in a sense where like so many elements of what the characters do to each other in this film really bothered me. But even the maid, even the head maid, yeah. I started watching this movie close to midnight. 
I, thinking I was just going to at least watch half of it tonight. I'll watch the rest of the morning. I sat up the entire time. Like I said, my wife woke up and she sat with me the entire time. We'd pause every like half hour and go, what the? And then we'd go get some like popcorn and we sat down again. Like we watched this movie. I did not intend to watch it in one sitting. I was just trying to squeeze in a time where I could see it. And it pulled me in and it kept me there. And I think uh, that's that's something powerful. And I think that kind of kind of outlines here what our, our patron. I can see like that that he's a big fan of the impact that a movie leaves you with. Because many of the films that he's suggested to us and the ones we've talked about with him have been ones of impact right. near the end. And but I like I said, a this is a movie. Here. Movies can be uh, really good movies are unforgettable or memorable. This is both. Mm -hmm. It's really the soft set direction, art direction, yeah. and setting and costuming and acting are really memorable. And the story and everything about it is really unforgettable. I'm not going to forget that I saw this movie. No, it's going to stay with me for a it's while. It's going to stay, right? And yeah. it's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good notion, too, of like find people that have similar interests as you do in the film scape and stick with them. Uh, Almodovar has continually worked with cinematographer Jose Luis Alcane and production designer Anton, Anton I think I'm saying Gomez, um, through many films. And yeah. so they've kept this similar style of creating this kind of like this beautiful visual appeal to a film and kind of beautiful in the way that even like they focus on a, a glass or they focus on a table and stuff like that and like everything is elevated and has a really nice painted feel to it but that's because they've probably gone through the yes and testing of working with each other through film after film after film um overall you're not going to get a lot of noms for the writing material it's definitely chunky writing but mm -hmm. it, it's what the content of the story you have to almost feel it because we get to the point like, all right, we need some exposition, and we get it, and it's kind of, it's a little bit, doesn't really go smoothly with the exposition, but it's necessary. But it's also disturbing to unveil what the hell's going on, right? The writing of the exposition isn't what, what kind of like I would have changed. It's more yeah. of the editing of the exposition. I think there, there's a moment when we, about an hour in, I think, where we are like, okay, here's what's happening. And we go yeah. back, back in time, and we see everything unfold and explain to us what's going on. I would have maybe, if I were the editor, would have peppered clues in a little bit heavier early on in the film and let the audience kind of have some detective work in it. There's another film that escapes me with Ethan Hawke that does kind of the same thing, where it's like they're dealing with a lot of similar, similar story beats, but it's done in a very peppered in way where you're trying to peel back and figure out what's going on yourself. Definitely. I would have done that. It's not saying they're wrong for doing it, but it's just purposely with the exposition. I agree with you. There were some heavy exposition moments that we would have broken up differently. A little bit. Right. It seems a little bit placed in, but it had to be placed in. It's got to be there, it's without a doubt. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a little bit. Yeah. I would say overall, I like the movie. I liked it. I really, really I like. This it. is the kind of horror I like, where it's not like scream, slasher, blood, and you know how disgusting everything. But this oh my, is you really, like that stuff too. <laughs> but this is this is something that you couldn't consume. But it's very like overall the horror. It's disturbing. Yep, and I like unique experiences. I don't know that Almodovar has done any other horror films. I, I didn't bother looking. Um, and again, having only seen two of his movies, I don't know about. But I like horror that messes with your mind and just messes with your mind. Yeah. And this is one, it's a unique experience by a director that I don't think I want to make the jump with him from doing his own type of stuff in his home country to American films like Del Toro is the kind of director that I think has a good fitting for making American movies. I want Almodovar to stay making the kind of movies he's making because they're one of a kind. <laughs> All right. So overall, that's thumbs up, man. Yeah, definitely yeah. thumbs up for both of us. Uh, what did you think about The Skin I Live In? Right now, it's currently streaming on HBO Max. Um, yeah, that's also awesome. rent and purchase it from various other uh, locations. So give it a watch and then come back and let us know your thoughts on the film. Thank you once again to Brian Eggert from uh, uh, Deep Broke Focus Reviews for suggesting this film. Um, again, every time he picks a movie, it's always one where I'm like on the verge of interested in seeing it, and I'm always kind of swayed by it. So thank you once again for that. Um, don't forget as well, you can like, you can comment, you can... Subscribe to the channel. You can join the Patreon. All the things Nick mentioned at the beginning of the episode, check out the links down in the description down there uh, to get more of that information. And you can join for as low as a dollar, but if you join for $5 and up, you get um, the opportunity to pick Patreon picks like this one. Um, and there you have it. So once again, you can find all my film reviews over on GoFilmReviews.com. Uh, you can find the St. Paul Filmcast anywhere you can find uh, podcasts. And uh, this is Nick. I don't and I'm not starting yoga, I don't care. I'm not even I'm not going there. Just never gonna eat a spit, you know. <laughs>